Hi, welcome back to Women Who Encounter Jesus. I decided to do one more day about the adulteress, the woman that the Pharisees brought before Jesus in the temple. They really did it to trick him. They brought her in and they said she was found uh, committing adultery. And according to Moses, we want to stone her. We need to stone her. And they were doing this strictly to, to, uh, to trick Jesus into betraying himself and getting himself in trouble. Jesus, of course, was smarter than that, didn't let it happen. Um, but we found out in the last sessions that the, that they were actually condemning her to this punishment and condemning her actions and judging her, but they weren't really doing it according to God's law because they brought the woman, they didn't bring the man with them. They said she had to be stoned, and that wasn't true in the law. And then thirdly, the law specifically states that there had to be witnesses who actually saw this take place. And there had to be not just one person accusing her, but two or three witnesses. And of course, that wasn't true. They had no witnesses. So they were just basically stirring up trouble. But in the meantime, the person they hurt was this woman, this woman caught in adultery. We don't know whether she actually did it or not. Maybe they, maybe these were trumped up charges, but I have a feeling that it was true because at the end, Jesus says, go and sin no more. So he must have known that there was some truth to this. However, they were judging her. And what about their sin? You know, that, that's what's interesting to me, is that in Romans, uh, Romans 2, I think it is. Yeah, Romans 2, verse 1, it says, You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge another... You are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Harsh words, harsh words. But it says, basically what it's saying is that we don't have enough spiritual uh, wisdom or insight to judge others. We see their actions, certainly. And we don't, that doesn't mean we, we follow along with someone we think is doing something wrong. No, that's not true at all. Um, but... We definitely don't know what motivates people, why they're doing something, even when somebody does something good. We don't know. We don't know whether they've done it to please God or maybe to get a little, uh, you know, a little praise for themselves. So we just really, truly don't know. And we don't have enough spiritual insight to do that. Therefore, Je Jesus tells us, don't judge. Don't judge. Because when you judge... You, you yourself have some sin there, you know? So whatever you're condemning the other person for, you're kind of condemning yourself at the same time because you're no better than that person. And so these Pharisees and leaders were, were judging her and condemning her to being up in front of all these people in all her shame. That is really sad. I mean, very sad. They're destroying her life. And of course, she did things wrong. But haven't we all? I mean, that's the point of, of Romans 2. That's the point of a lot of Romans. If you read that book, it's all about how everybody's kind of equal in the sight of God. You know, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God comes from Romans. It's every person. It doesn't matter what sin you've had. So they, um, you know, they judged her and they're going to be judged by their own yardstick in a way. What I think is great is that when they all left... He, he, after he bent down on the ground, wrote things, and whatever it was, they got convicted, and they all scurried away. The oldest first, and then the youngest. Then Jesus kind of straightened up, and he looked right at her, and he said, Woman, if I just stop there, woman, it's kind of like he's connecting with her, isn't it? There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of love in, in that word. He doesn't just uh, stay where he is looking down at the ground and kind of talk to her over his shoulder. No, he straightens up. He makes eye contact with her. And he says, woman, getting her attention, drawing her in. Where are they? Has no one condemned you? I often like to put my own name in there. And I, I would encourage you to do this a lot in the scripture. Karen, has no one condemned you? You know, Sue, where is everybody? Has nobody condemned you? Well, neither do I. 
know, Jesus is really talking to us at the same time he's talking to this woman. He's saying, neither do I condemn you. I think that's a great expression of his grace and his mercy. I remembered a verse from John chapter 3, verse 17. And this is what it says about Jesus' mission. John says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In order to be saved, we have to recognize that we need a Savior. We have to recognize that we have sinned. Okay? But Jesus didn't come just to point out our sins and condemn us. You're bad. You didn't measure up. You don't make the grade. You're a loser. No. You, you got to go to death. You're punished. This is not why Jesus came into the world. Quite the contrary. He came into the world so that we would not have to face that kind of condemnation. We could be freed from that condemnation. And that's what he's telling her. He's saying, hasn't anybody condemned you? Well, neither do I. I'm not going to condemn you. I'm not going to point the finger at you and say you're a bad person, you're a loser, you're doing things wrong. However, he does say, go and sin no more. So there is conviction there, but not condemnation. Those are big words, and we hear them a lot in church, and we kind of let them go, you know, right over our heads. I do anyway. <laughs> Maybe you do too. Conviction, but not condemnation. That means Jesus wants us to face up to what's really going on in our lives. He doesn't want us in denial, okay? That's conviction. We need to see what's going on. We need to be convicted if we do something wrong. Or convicted sometimes even of a positive thing. I'm convicted to go over and visit my neighbor who's all by herself. I look over there and I think, mm, I should really go over and vi you know, visit her. That's a conviction. You know, I, I get that feeling inside and I know that's what God would want me to do. Okay, that's a conviction. So the Bible Scripture verses that we read, or if we're listening to a sermon, or maybe even hearing a song, sometimes we get convicted. We either see something bad in ourselves, or we're prompted to do something good. Those are convictions. Those are great things. There is conviction in the Christian life. There is not condemnation. Condemnation is pointing the finger, you're bad, you're wrong. Okay, As we talked in the last session, this difference between guilt and shame a conviction can show you where you've done wrong. But then Jesus says, you have freedom in me. So all you have to do is, is turn around. You just have to turn away from that and say, God, I'm so sorry. Help me live a better way. Give me a, give me a different direction to go in. Give me the strength to do that. It's not about beating yourself up. Oh, I'm such a terrible person. That's condemnation. Okay? It's not about that. It's not about doing penance or making up for it, or doing a bunch of good things to make up for all the wrong things. No, that's all about condemnation. The Christian life is not about condemnation. It's about grace. Grace. Free forgiveness for all. Because everybody is worthwhile in God's eyes. And we're all the same in God's eyes. The Bible tells us very clearly, again, in Romans, and by the way, if you don't have a good basis for grace, and you maybe weren't raised in a church that was grace-oriented, or or maybe you're, you're just the kind of person that has a negative view of yourself, Romans can open your eyes to what God really thinks of you. Because Romans 8.1 is so beautiful. It says, so now. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Again, I hate to use big words, but it's true. There is conviction, but there's not condemnation. Conviction is a good thing. It helps us turn back to the, the right way of living. Condemnation isn't. Condemnation is negative. And there is no condemnation, no punishment, right? And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. So what they're saying here is we have the power of the Holy Spirit and that is freeing us. We don't have to continue being uh, bound 
by something somebody told us or something we believe about ourselves or some sin that we keep doing over and over and over, okay? Suppose I grew up in a family where everybody told me, you are such a bad person. You're always naughty. You're always terrible. We don't love you. You know, if I grew up in that, I might believe that. And I might be bound by it. I might still be living out that same role that somebody else told me. But this is saying... If you believe in Jesus and you have the power of the Holy Spirit, you don't have to live that way anymore. The power of sin that leads to death has been broken. You are freed from that. So if we continue on, he's going to get into Moses a little bit, which is exactly what the Pharisees were trying to do. This is verse 3 of Romans 8. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weaknesses of our sinful nature. Now, the law of Moses was there to convict us, to show us our sin, okay? But it just keeping laws is not enough to make you good in God's eyes. It just doesn't work that way. The laws are there because they're good things for us to do, but it can't save us. It can't save us because we can never keep them perfectly. Only Jesus could keep them perfectly. So the, the verse continues. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his only son in a body, just like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer have to follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. It all starts with the death and resurrection of Jesus because that's why there's no condemnation because that punishment was already paid and condemnation is punishment, okay? Sometimes we do condemnation to ourselves, I think, you know? Um, but this verse says we don't have to be condemned. And let me I was trying to think of all the things for me that that meant. Um, first of all, we have mercy, which means we don't get the punishment. So we're not condemned to hell. It's one condemnation we don't have. We have grace. And grace means we get the free gift of heaven. Great. We're not condemned to be a slave to sin then, according to Romans. We're not condemned to make the same mistake over and over again. Well, I got to do it. That's the way I was brought up. I can't help it. I got you know. No. No, 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 no. We're freed from that. All we need to do is depend on the power of the Holy Spirit to break those cycles of behavior, especially the ones that come from our childhood. We don't have to be condemned to be a slave to something that someone told us about ourselves, okay? You don't have to live that way. We're not condemned by Satan. Satan can't condemn us. The enemy can't. He might try. He might try to accuse you. He tries to make you live in shame, I'm sure, because it's better for him if we live in shame. But listen to this, this verse from Revelations. It's such a great verse. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, this is, this is the enemy, this is Satan, the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. Boom, you're gone. You know, when, when, when Satan is saying to God day and night, look at Karen, she's a waste of time. She's sinning all over the place, okay? All that happens is Jesus. God says, well, but she believes in Jesus. So in my book, she's righteous. She's perfect. She's, her sins are like gone. All I see is Jesus, <laughs> you know? So the enemy is like, goodbye, hurled down. You're gone, you're gone. You're done. <laughs> Your power is empty. You can accuse all you like, but it's not going to help. That's great news because if the enemy can't accuse us and we don't have to give in to the enemy accusing us, how does the enemy accuse you? I think a lot of times it's in our own heads. It comes, a thought comes into my head. Nobody likes me. Okay. Or, um, I'm too fat or I'm too loud or I'm too soft. Um, I'm too brazen or I'm too shy. 
nobody, nobody cares about me. Um, I don't have any worth. Who cares if I'm there or not? Nobody will miss me. Um, I think we judge ourselves very harshly. And when we do that, that is like the accuser accusing us of not being worthy. And, and in God's eyes, that is just not true. He says to us, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He loves every single one of us exactly the way he made us. And we can't give in to that kind of condemnation from the enemy, from other people, from our own thoughts. We're freed from that. We're freed from that kind of condemnation. And so was she, this woman standing there. He says, isn't there anybody here to condemn you? She goes, no, nobody's here. He goes, well, I don't either. I don't condemn you either. We're not condemned to live in the guilt and the shame. She, he did not say to that woman, leave, and uh, I know you're going to feel bad about this the rest of your life, but that's okay. You deserve it. <laughs> he didn't say that. He just said, go and sin no more. Guess what? You're free to go now and live a wonderful life. That, that's unbelievable. I mean, it's unbelievable. He never, never told her to live in shame. He never mentioned it. Far from it. You know, shame is buried a lot more deeply than guilt. And she was guilty. I'm, I'm pretty sure she was guilty because he says, go and sin no more, right? So she probably was guilty. But he doesn't say you should be ashamed of yourself. He doesn't say that. Go. And sin no more. It's kind of like opening the doors to a prison cell and saying, step out, you're free. But as any prisoner, you always have the choice. You can commit more sin or you can turn your life around and go a different way. So this is the choice she had when she walked away from Jesus. She had a choice. He said, go and sin no more. And now it's up to her. If she believes in Jesus and if she rests in his power, she can live a different kind of life, a more joyous life, a happier life. But she does have a choice. She does have a choice. And go and sin no more really means turn your life around. Get it together, lady. You know? <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Um, I have a few more things to say about shame, and I think I'm going to wait till tomorrow. And then I do have a little song that I loved that I got that I found on YouTube that I really liked and it, it kind of has the same theme that nobody can condemn you and you shouldn't be condemning yourself you should be convicted you should be convicted of whatever it is you've done wrong or whatever changes you need to make we can't be in denial and not look at it we need to be convicted and then we need to go and ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to make a new start because there's always that freedom of a new start with Jesus. And that's exactly what this woman got, a fresh start. Go and sin no more. I guess we won't maybe be able to label her as the adulteress if she goes and does what Jesus told her, to sin no more. I hope you have a wonderful day today. Enjoy yourself. Find some blessings in today and just thank the Lord for them. Have a good one. Bye-bye.